together today, eh? It's great to see you. Why don't you stand to your feet? This morning, I'm excited because we have this community. We have this fellowship together as brothers and sisters in Christ because of Jesus Christ, because of our relationship with Him. I'm thankful for that. And uh, I just wanted to take a second to encourage you and to uh, kind of spur you into action, I think, this morning. I had to do it myself, so I'm encouraging you to do the same. Uh, I want to remind you of two things, and they are the reasons that we are here. The first is God is worthy. He's worthy to be praised, worthy of all glory, and I think that's reason enough. But the second thing is the reason we come together here in this room and online is that we believe and expect that God is going to move, that he's going to do amazing, amazing things, that he is still performing miracles to this day, that those things can happen today that happened yesterday, that he is consistent throughout all time, that he is our loving Heavenly Father. And today we are just going to pour out praise. And I just want to tell you that I can't sing it for you. I can sing over you. But you got to use your own voice. you got to use your own lungs. It's just your way of pouring out love and adoration to the Father and letting Him do what He does best. So today, we're just going to praise together, and I encourage you, just sing out with all you've got. Surrender if you need to. You can lift your hands. You can lift your voices. But just praise the Heavenly Father together today. Let's sing this together. I pray.
no one like you, Jesus. No one like you. Just come out of you. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me yet you haven't lied
promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm in our own power, but we expect and we stand here in confidence knowing that you are going to move for your name's sake, for your kingdom's sake. We stand in all of you, God. We thank you and we praise you as one voice, as one voice, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. You guys sound great. What an awesome time of worship. I love singing with you. Why don't you take a second and just greet those around you. You can say hello to somebody around you, or you can go across the room, shake some hands, fist bump, give a hug, do whatever you got to do. And those of you online, you're part of this family too. Why don't you leave a comment? We'd love to hear you. Welcome to the church next door. We are so glad you're here. Whether this is your first time here or this is the church you call home, we want to be sure you've filled out a Connect card. This card helps us get to know you a little bit better so that if you don't call this church home yet, we can help it feel like home. Once you've filled out your card, take it over to our Welcome Center for a free gift to remember your first time here. We can't wait to get to know you better and just want to thank you for not only taking that first step to get to know us, but for valuing the importance of experiencing Christ in community. Our mission at the church next door is to help move people closer to God. Our regular weekend service times are on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 9.20 a.m. and 11 a.m. You can join us at those times here inside the church or online on Facebook Live, YouTube, and on our website at thechurchnextdoor.org. I heard a great truth this week. This fella told me there is no discipleship 
without connection. That is absolutely accurate. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus if you are not connected to other disciples of Jesus. Well, next weekend, we are going to give you two great opportunities to get connected with the disciples of Jesus right here at the church next door. The first is our men's breakfast. We're going to gather on Saturday. It's going to be March the 2nd at 9 a.m. We're going to meet here in the sanctuary. We're going to have a great breakfast, some great food. We're going to have a time of fellowship. We're going to hear a message from Pastor Doyle. Maybe you've never been to one of these before, men. I encourage you to come. I will be roaming around the room. I will make sure you meet somebody. And when you leave here, you are connected with another disciple of Jesus. Our second opportunity is going to be the next day on Sunday, March the 3rd at 1215, right after our second Sunday morning service. We're going to have next steps. We're going to meet in the chapel in the back. We're going to have some pizza, have a little fun, get to know each other and talk about how we can move closer with God and each other. Next steps is open to everyone. If you've been worshiping here with us but have never got connected with us this is your opportunity we hope to see you there men's breakfast saturday the second next step sunday the third hope you can make it Jennifer, and this is the time in our service where we give gifts to God, and you can do that on your phone, you can do that online, we have boxes in the back of the room. I, as a part of Simply for Women, I want you to know that I have been praying hugging and crying with women for over 32 years as a pastor's wife. And I tell them, I say, God invites us to simply take him off our to-do list and just to be, to be with him, to be with him in his word, to be with him in prayer and to be with him one-on-one. And when I meet with women, he meets with us. And these are the intangible things that your gifts, that your tie, that your check gives to. And so I thought I would tell you a few of those because they're invisible. But I was talking to a woman, she came up to me recently and she said, Jennifer, you are never gonna believe this. I'm, she was only like in her forties and her husband had died. And in August, she was at the grave and she was digging and she was planting flowers, pulling weeds. And she pulled up her phone, was listening to Simply for women and she said that episode was Miss Achanga talking about grief and she said in that moment I knew that God cared about my grief I was talking with another friend a young friend that I've been working with and she said Jennifer I told my boyfriend that until I have a ring and until we're married I'm not going to sleep with you anymore and he said why what's wrong don't you like me anymore and she said no I've just been falling in love with Jesus and he's my number one. You're my number two. And they're still together. You know, that's repentance. I think about this woman that came just two weeks ago and she had had a really bad diagnosis and we prayed and she went back later in that week to her doctor and her her doctor said, we've actually made a mistake that never happens. I don't know how this happened. And she said, she said, well, I've been praying. I've been praying at my church. I said, that wasn't a mistake. You know, in my Bible, I have actually written down six women that I've prayed for who received phenomenal answers in their physical body. God is doing that. I was talking with a young girl recently and she was on social media and she said, Jennifer, I can't believe that you pray on social media. You've given me the courage to pray. And I was like, oh, I didn't even think about it. I just pray on social media. I pray everywhere, right? That are, those are the things. These are just some of the things that when you give, God does. He is transforming people, their hearts and their lives. So why don't we agree together in prayer that that would continue, that that would multiply. Lord, I thank you for these tithes. Lord, these are hard earned dollars. Lots of work went into these gifts and God, we're presenting them to you right now saying all the things in the invisible realm, Lord, would you multiply them? God, would you move in people's hearts? God, would you help them to turn back to you? Lord, would you heal their bodies? Would you clear their minds? Would you encourage their soul and their griefs, Lord? We thank you, God, that your mission goes far and wide because of these gifts. In Jesus' name, amen.
we'll, be married, we'll have been married for a year next month on August 12th. Yep. Yep. We didn't start with our names. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. My name is Tiffany Taylor. I'm Austin. Cecil Clay. C E C I L C L A Y. He spells it all the time. Ron and I, we've been married 32 years. We'll be married 24 years. A kid now? 11 Man. years. 11 years Sunday. On Sunday. Yes, I forgot. Yeah. She's awful with directions, and I'll tell her, why Why didn't you turn right there? And why can't you see it the way that I do? And I'm like, think logically. <laughs> Make a rational decision. Her iPhone. You know, she's addicted to her iPhone. At our at our wedding, before while I was getting ready, he gave me a frozen turkey. You're just being dramatic. But I will tell you something, and you totally hear it a different way than what I intended it to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do over scratch that. I mean, 32 years, we have a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, hey, let's just talk this through. We can talk this through and still get our points across. It could get a little heated sometimes where we're not, we don't yell at each other, but we're making our point. You know, there have been a couple of really dark times in our marriage that um, struggles. I mean, you're saying I'm weak and I need help. Help me with my, my relationship. That's something no man wants to be like, uh, yeah, I need help there. I think we just think of things differently. Marriage is tough. It is not easy. Marriage is tough. It's not easy. I mean, uh, surprise that uh, the opposite person in your marriage is different from you. What? What? This is obvious, right? Why is it we think it's going to be so easy? Because we want it to be easy. All right? And the truth is, it's not easy. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult being in relationship with people. I mean, when you go to work, you think it's going to be easy getting along with everybody at work? No, it's not. It's not going to be easy getting along with people at school. That's because people are people, and we're sinful. And so we make mistakes. So right now, we're in a series. We started it a couple weeks ago. Dan and Rachel Patton started us out, and they talked about the inheritance, the importance of, of what you and I pass on to our kids. Then last week, I talked about the truth about men. And then several people asked me, what are you going to talk about next week? I said, the truth about women. And they're like, oh, I'm sure glad I'm not you, pastor. You know, men shouldn't talk about that. But I, I have to talk about it because the world in which you and I live is, is imagining that there's more than just men and women. They want us to abandon the notion that men and women are what we're created and that there's a plethora of things. And, and, I, and I, I submit to you, that's problematic. Last night on my news feed, okay, I'm, I'm looking at my, my phone and it says Richard Dawkins. Okay, so Richard Dawkins is not just an atheist. He is a very vocal, very vocal anti-God, anti-Christian worldview. And he's on X and he's like, no, it is not possible. We are binary. We are male and female. See, Richard Dawkins is a biologist. And he says there's just no way around it. It, it doesn't matter what you're trying to say. You're incorrect. The science does not support what you're saying. And they are going after Richard Dawkins. And I'm looking at it, I'm going, Richard Dawkins is defining a godly worldview. <laughs> Our world is upside down. Same news feed, same news feed. I'm, I'm watching in Massachusetts, a girls basketball team coach, he had to, he had to cancel he, the game. They're halfway through the game, and he says, I'm forfeiting. Three girls have been so injured by the trans guy on the other team that they've got video footage of the girls getting hurt to the point that they cannot play anymore. And our world is acting like that is normal. No, there's a reason we created Title 19. We wanted girls to be able to have sports. We want women to have a place in this world. And yet our world is trying to combine them and they're saying that, that you and I can, can switch where we are. And so we have to take some time because it's impacting the way we relate to one another within our homes, within our communities, and within our world. So we're gonna take some time to do that today, okay? I wanna encourage you. I want you to know, ladies, let me just say this to you first of all. I love you. 
God loves you. You're valuable. You are beautiful. You are smart. You are a blessing. The truth about women is this. God designed you, and yes, he designed men too. We're going to get there. First, I want to tell you, so this past week, uh, six of us went to Nashville to the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. The reason we're there is because we want to find out how can we share Christ in the world in which we live. So there's a couple thousand people there from all over the world, all over the nation, and what they're trying to do is get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. And we were there. We had a booth there. We had Nicole and Alice and Heather and Vince. They were there helping. And what they did was people would come by the booth. They would kind of interview them and talk to them, tell them about our ministry. And so people are sharing the ministry of the church next door now because they heard about us there. And then some of those people said, well, um, I would be willing to share my testimony. I would talk about what God's done in my life. And so we got to interview some people. One of the people I got to interview is Barry McGuire. Barry McGuire, you may know him if you ever waxed your car with McGuire's car wax. That's Barry McGuire, okay? He is an amazing Christian. He grew up with Jim Dobson, and, and he helped David Wilkerson find the property in Times Square to build Times Square Church. He loves God, and right now, he's putting his whole life into igniting your faith, igniting America to share their, their Jesus story. And so you're gonna, he's going to be on the podcast, and we're going to share more about his book and what he's doing. Secondly, Jennifer and I got to meet Elisa Childers. Elisa Childers, you may know her if uh, you ever heard of Zoe Girl, the Christian band from several years ago. Well, she was on fire for God, and, and, and when she stepped away from the band, she and her family became a part of a church plant. They didn't realize it, but their plant, their pastor of this church plant was actually an agnostic. He said, I'm a hopeful agnostic. And, and he led them down a pathway of, of doubting scripture, doubting their faith. And she said, I, I felt like I was just being, I was beginning to be drowned. And in the midst of that, she sought God and turned it around. She wrote a book several years ago. It's called Another Gospel. I highly recommend it. But you're going to get to hear uh, Jennifer interview her. See, the reason we're doing this is we want to help you know what's going on in the world around us. One more story. One more story. So I'm, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting there in this, in this meeting, and, and this man sits down next to me, and, and I start talking to him. And he said, I'm from Florida. I said, oh, great, man. Can I come visit you next winter? And um, that's funny, all right? Just want to help you there. That's funny. We need friends in Florida. We're in Ohio, all right? He asked me this question. He said, I just, I just saw this book, and I, I've been reading it by Eric Metaxas, a letter to the American church, and I, I just have a question for you. You're a pastor. He said, do you talk about what's going on in the culture from the pulpit? I said, I have to, because the people in my church live in the culture that we're a part of. We don't, we don't, we're not on some other planet. Every day we have to make decisions about how to be godly in a world that's very ungodly. So I love my church and I want to help them through the waters of the world in which we live. I have to talk about what's going on in our culture. And, and so he was like, oh, wow. I said, well, does your pastor? He said, no. He never talks about any of this stuff. He does Bible studies and stuff, but, 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 but we, don't, we don't get any pushback on what's going on in the culture and how to approach it and whatnot. And I said, well, you need to take your pastor to coffee and you need to tell him either he starts talking about that or you got to find a church that will help you. He said, you mean leave? I said, yeah. But I said this, I said, if you'll raise up a group of men to stand around your pastor and encourage him and pray for him and say, we're going to be here with you, we're going to be your armor bearers, let me tell you something, your church will begin to grow, your church will begin to flourish because that's the point of the church. I said, I can tell you that because I'm part of a church that went from dying to life and growth. And I said, there is no church, there is no church that grows unless there's an active, an active congregation and a pastor that believe the word of God and will teach the word of God. It's a 50-50 operation here. And I said, you've got to come together and you've got to agree that the congregation's got to share their faith and you're going to help them do that and live it out. And I can tell you this, we've seen our church come to life and be effective and, 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 and God is being glorified because see, that's the goal for God to be glorified. And so uh, I'm praying for him now. I met some other people. It was a great experience. And this is what I want you to know. 
God is alive. The gospel is going out in our nation and around the world. There are people that are laying down everything in their life. They are, they are making sacrifices to get the gospel out there. It's so encouraging. It's so beautiful. And, and we're going to be a part of what God is doing in the earth today. Amen? So, so let's talk about, let's talk about uh, women because we love women, right? It's a good thing. And so when, when, when we're talking about that, what's interesting to me is that my life has been shaped by women. So I, I don't understand the people who, who somehow act like, I, I just don't. I mean, my, my mom has been great in my life. Jennifer's been great. My, my uh, mother-in-law is here. I love my mother-in-law. I don't know what we would do without the, the, the people in our lives. And, and I, was, I was thinking about the history of women and in in, in, in kind of the world in which we live. I thought about my grandma Davidson, okay? Her name was Alba. I bet you've never known an Alba, all right? Alba was my grandma. I love Grandma Alba. And, and my grandma and grandpa got married in the 1920s. Now, the reason that's important to me is I never thought about the fact that my grandmother spent part of her life without the right to vote. See, in, in, in 1916, Woodrow Wilson was our president. And women had been fighting for the right to vote in America since 1848, okay? So it's nearly, nearly 70 years. 50 to, to 70 years is what it took. Well, Woodrow Wilson is president. He's a Democrat. He was not for women having the right to vote, okay? In, in uh, 1919, okay, uh, Roosevelt died. Teddy Roosevelt. He was expected to run for president again. And Wilson uh, was going to run for president for a third time, but he was older. He was declining in his health, and, 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 and he didn't have the support. And so when, when Teddy Roosevelt fell out of it, we ended up with two guys running for president, one Warren G. Harding, the other James Cox. They're both from Ohio. One was the senator from Ohio, a Republican, Harding, and Cox was a Democrat, and he was our governor, and they ran for president. Now, while this is going on, in the middle of the presidential election, we, we have Will, uh, Woodrow Wilson flip on the issue of women's voting. The Congress got it through, okay, went through the House and the Senate, the approval of the 19th Amendment. And Wilson flips, and he says, I'll sign it. He approves of women voting, and it goes to a constitutional convention. And it begins to go across our country, state after state after state began to approve it. Now, there were some states in the South that weren't, weren't approving of it, and like any constitutional convention, it, it has its issues, okay? It gets to the state of Tennessee. Know anybody from there? And, and, and it gets there, and Tennessee is split over the vote. It's 48 to 48, and the tie-breaking vote is a young man by the name of Harry T. Byrne. He's a representative in Tennessee. He's 23 years old. Do you hear me on this? 23 years old. And he gets a letter from his mama. Yeah. He was going to vote no, but he gets a letter from his mama, and she says this. She says, Harry, be a good boy and vote yes. And he does. And the 19th Amendment is passed. That's August of 1920. Guess what happens in November of 1920? 45% of the women show up to vote. They've never gotten to vote before. And that's how we get Warren Harding as our president. Now, you say, well, what, what's your point? Listen, feminism, feminism at times has been a real blessing. But lately, we've run into some situations where feminism is not doing what it ought to do. And so when you and I look at the issue of women in the world in which we live, I think it was 1740s when the first 
feminist movement in England began, and that first, first round of feminism was all about women getting education and opportunity to learn and, 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 and to grow, okay? I, I took a feminism class in college, all right? Only guy in the room. Really smart, really smart as a guy. I'll just say that, all right? I was smarter than the average guy. But, but, but what I learned in the process of my life is that there's, this, is, this is kind of my world. I, I could be wrong, okay? But there's been four major changes in feminism. That first one was about education, okay? The second move of feminism was, was more about women having the right to vote. And that took, like I just told you, almost 70 years, okay? Kind of the third wave is, is the world that, that, that we grew up in. I'll say we. I'm putting this all together. So I just downgraded some of you and upgraded others of you, okay? It was, it was the sexual revolution. It was about women having rights, you know, making bacon and frying it up in the pan. You remember that? Okay? And, 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 but in that sexual revolution, what happened is it ended up in relationships that weren't under God's covering of marriage. And the fruit of that was children that were not wanted in the womb and outside of the womb. Men that didn't want to really be fathers and women that didn't, it just got confusing. And it, what, you know what it did? That wave of feminism has caused a lot of hurt that you and I feel, okay? Now, at the same time, there was some good in there right? Because women had some opportunities for jobs and it opened up some doors. And, and so we're not against that, okay? But we have to look at, when we look at feminism, we don't just look at it a blanket statement that all feminism is good for our culture and that all feminism is good for the church or, or the Word of God. And so that's why we're going to take a look at this, okay? The current iteration of feminism seems to have become a part of of what you and I in our world now know as LGBTQ+. And at times, it's hard to see how women are being valued in that when you see high school sports having to forfeit and young men in women's locker rooms. And that's all I'll say, okay? That's why this is important for us to have the discussion. So let's dive into the Word of God, okay? God's creation. This is where we started last week, and I think it's really important for us to understand all right, what God has to say about us. In Genesis 1, 26 through 28, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, so God is making mankind, but you see, he, he comes to us and then this is what he says. He says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So that means both men and women are created in God's image. But there's something about you and I together that is also reflective of God's image. And when we look at this, what's amazing about it is we are the crescendo. When I say we, I don't mean men. I mean men and women. We are the crescendo. You and I, when we look at ourselves in the mirror as men and women, when we look at ourselves, we see ourselves and we're like, God was pleased with this. God saw this as good. God was really like, now, I want you to go out and live for my glory. Glorify me. See, when you and I understand who we are under God's creation, it brings a satisfaction to us. It brings a peace to us. It brings a contentment to us. Now, does that mean that, that I, can, I can do everything? No, there, there's limitations on me by my creation, all right? I have blue eyes. When I go out in the bright sunshine, I really need my sunglasses. I have limitations in my creation, all right? I love babies. I love rocking babies, holding babies, but Jennifer had the privilege of carrying babies within her womb. I'll never have that. And see, there's something about our creation that we need one another in order to fulfill that. Am I saying if you're single that you need to get married? No. I want to be clear on that. All right? Not everybody needs to get married, wants to get married, or is God called to be married? Okay? And so, but, but you are still male or female. 
in that. Notice this. Keep reading with me, okay? Genesis chapter 20, 20, chapter 1, verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So God created us, both men and women. He created us, and, and he loves us, and we're so valuable. We didn't evolve. <laughs> we didn't develop, you know, that's just the way we are. God created us this way. And so it's important for you and I to lean into that and celebrate that. Women and men are equally valued by God. I just said it, that, that, that we have different roles. We have different opportunities because of who we are. You know, uh, some of us, we are better, I don't know, in art. We can draw. Others of us, you know, stick figures as good as it gets. You know, see what I'm saying? Uh, we, we, we all have different abilities within that, that framework, and that's the way God created us. And we want to begin to live that out. We want to walk in that. We want to celebrate that. You know, recently um, I was thinking about this and how it worked out in my life. I was thinking about, well, first about my calling. I was like, God, thank you for calling me and, and speaking to my life. And, and I was thinking about, about when I came to know the Lord in the sense that I had a purpose for my life and he had a specific calling for my life. I knew the Lord, but then as I began to read the word of God and develop, I was in college and, and God gave me that. I said, okay, God, I'll do that. Then a few years later, I, I look at Jennifer and I said, of course, hubba hubba, good thing. Let's see if she'll marry me. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm going on, okay? You don't need to know any more of that. I, I remember talking to Jennifer. I also remember talking to Dad to get approval. He's sitting here. He's my witness, okay? And, and, and I remember us having conversations early on, and I said, I, you know, you have to understand, God has a call on my life, and I can't marry you unless you're good with that and that you agree to that calling, that you want, A, to be a part of that, you recognize that, and, and it made me real nervous, it made me real nervous, okay? Because I thought, you know, she could say, no way. God is a calling on my life and I'm heading in this direction. That doesn't fit where I'm going. And I had to say, I'm cool with that, all right? If God takes it that direction. But Jennifer said, no. She said, I really feel like that's God's calling on my life and that this is us together under God. Now, you may be saying, well, why, why is that so important? I think that too many of us are getting married with the imagination that somehow marriage is going to fix us or somehow we imagine that I have this plan and you got to come along with me in this. I was not trying to make that happen. I was, I was just giving her freedom to say, no, this isn't for me. See, when we come together as man and woman in marriage, that's so that we can bring glory to God and fulfill his purpose. And we, we agreed that it was God calling on our life. And if you're a young person, I want to really encourage you to approach it that way. Because some of my, my brothers and sisters today are trying to figure out how to work out their calling because they came to know Christ after they were married. And I don't think you have the right to punt your marriage because now you became a Christian. We'll talk more about that next week. Jennifer's going to speak with me next week, okay? She may clean up any messes I make today in talking about women, all right? Um, but what was interesting to me is this week, because we've approached our marriage that way, we're in Nashville and we're meeting with these ministry leaders and we, we go into this one meeting with uh, some executives from a ministry that's helping people share Christ all over the country. And we got done and we've been asking them questions and they're talking to us and we're leaving. And this young lady who's part of their executive team, she says, you guys are amazing. And I said, excuse me, you know? And she said, I, I see so many ministry leaders out there and you guys work together so well. I said, you got to tell me a little bit more what you mean. He, she said, I love the way that Jennifer supports you and you support Jennifer in God's calling on your life. And it's so refreshing. She said, I see ministry leaders in here 
and you never see their wives, you never hear about them, or, or, or the wife comes in and there's just not, not anything. Listen, my dream for you would be that if, if God calls you into marriage, that you would get a picture that you are a team. Doesn't mean we have the same gifts, same abilities, okay? But see, that's why we're created male and female, because we need each other. We need one another's love. We need one another's help. We need other one, one another's. Does that mean we have the same role? No. We're going to talk more about that next week, okay? The Scripture's clear on the responsibilities before God that I have and the responsibilities that Jennifer has. And see, that doesn't always jive with what our world is saying about men and women. And that's why we say you got to go to the Word of God. Um, if you're single, I want to say something to you. I was single for 26 years. It was not easy. I was on a college campus. I used to call it Sodom and Gomorrah because their worldview was part of the sexual revolution, and I'm trying to live according to God's standard. It was not the norm. And there were people that would try to get you to walk away from God's standard. There were people that would claim it, that that. The standard in Scripture really isn't the standard of Scripture. Listen, this is what the Word of God says. The Word of God says He created us male and female and that sexuality is part and partial of that relationship, but it's under the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. And so sexuality doesn't begin until the honeymoon after the wedding, okay? And, and our world wants to argue against that today. And that's why I say we're going to go with a biblical framework. And, and this is why. This is why. Because the temptation in our world is that we can do it differently in our generation. That's the temptation of our world. We are modern. We're up to date. We know better than our grandparents did. No, our grandma and grandpas knew better than we did in some ways. And they understood things that, that you and I don't understand. And see, this becomes important. I love this verse. It's from Proverbs twenty two twenty eight. If you read Proverbs 22, it has these different sayings. And this is the fifth saying. And it says, do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your ancestors. Do not move a, an ancient boundary stone set up. So in the same way that today, if you buy a piece of property, there's these key pins in the ground that are put there so that you can know exactly where the corner of the property is. So when you hire a survey and you purchase the land, and this, if you buy, if you buy a piece of property, you're going to have to pay an extra 500 bucks for the survey. Just telling you, it happens, all right? And, and, and then they're going to let you know where the property boundaries are. Why is that? Because the boundaries, the boundaries are important to each person that lives in the house and, and lives according to that standard. And in the ancient world, like today, there were people that wanted to steal property from people and they would move the pens. They'd move the boundary stones. And what's happening to you and I is we've received an inheritance from our parents and our grandparents about men and women, about marriage and about life, and we have a generation that wants to move the boundary stones. Now, I realize that that passage is talking about literal property, and I'm talking to you metaphorically about it. I understand that, but be careful about people moving the boundary stones. What are going to be your boundaries about sexuality if you're single, if you're married? What are going to be your boundaries about the way you deal with people when it comes to character? Are you going to be honest or is it okay to lie sometimes? See, our world is moving the boundary stones about morality and different things. They're taking God's standards and they're adjusting them. And I want you to be careful about that. You say, well, why is that so important? Because this is what the Bible says. God, said, God has boundaries and we can't ignore his voice. Deuteronomy 4.2. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. So God gave us the law. And, and some people would have you believe that it's just, well, it's just kind of, it's kind of there, you know. You don't have to go, out, you have no other gods. It's okay if I go to the, the home store and I buy, buy Buddha and bring him home and put him up in my home. No, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't decorate my home with the gods of other religions. I wouldn't decorate my home and my life with, with other worldviews that, that oppose God. That would not be helpful for me or my children. 
God says in there you can't covet your neighbor's wife. He says you can't covet your neighbor's things. That's about envy. And all, you know what our world says? Our world says, look at what your neighbor's got. You deserve that too. If you'll just come in and add an extra $100 to your payment, you can have that. And we'll own you for the rest of your life. And see, our world is built on envy. Every commercial out there is trying to get you to want this or that or whatever. And, 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 and we're making payments for the rest of our life on something we can't afford. And, and see, God says, be careful about that. Husbands, you're to love your wives. Scripture says you're to love your wife and you're to wash her with the word of God, that you're to be leading your family in that way. Wives, you're supposed to love your husbands and respect your husbands. That's because God has established the way these relationships work. Children, you're to honor your father and mother and long will be your life. And, and see, th this is the way we live under, under the the world in which you live. Right now, we have a world that will speak to your children while they're at school and say, we'll keep the secret from them. Your mom and daddy don't have to know this conversation is between us. You realize that that's illegal. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. In America, it is illegal for someone who's 15 years old or under to buy a car. Why? Because they can't do the contract. There are certain legal obligations which you have to come of age to engage in. Now, that's according to contract law in America. It goes all the way to states' constitutions and, and the U.S. Constitution. And these people are totally ignoring basic principles of law. And, and they're talking about, well, this is about parents' rights. Listen, I agree it's about parents' rights, but I'm telling you something. A child does not have the, the same opportunities that adult does historically in our nation. And we're, try, we're trying to give children powers that they don't, they don't historically have. It's why we used to, to, you can't become part of the military, you can't drink, you can't drive, you can't smoke. That's because, and and we're, we're conferring this. This becomes important because we're changing the notion of the world. And you know why? Because other people are getting access to them instead of the parents. Revelation 22, 18, 19. This is the end of the Bible. It says, I warn everyone, and here's the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. Ooh, plagues. So much fun. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this scroll. See, you and I live in an age that wants to add to the Word of God and take away from the Word of God, and our culture is saying, culture trumps, I did not mean a pun there, culture supersedes the Word of God, okay? Culture does not, does not supersede the Word of God. The Word of God says from the creation we were made this way. If you want to flourish, you live to glorify God and you obey His standards. And if you want to flourish, you enter into a covenant as a husband and wife and you'll be fruitful in that. If you're single, you enter into a covenant with God and you obey His principles and your life will flourish. You see, that's what, we, what we're, 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 we're pushing against. God's Word is our guide. It's our measuring line. It's, it's what helps us understand this. And our world is trying to get us to adjust. Let me ask you a question, okay? Let's say you're at home and, and, and you live in a neighborhood and you look out the window and you know your beautiful neighbor's kids, okay? You know them and, and you love them. You, you, you're for your neighbors having wonderful kids. And you see a van roll up in front of their house and someone who's strange, someone you don't recognize, they have the neighbor girl or the neighbor boy by the hand and they're dragging him across the lawn into that van and that kid is screaming and kicking and saying, no, no, I don't want to go with you. Do you remain quiet? And you say, well, you know, those are my neighbors and I don't want to get into their stuff. I'm sure it'll be, it'll be okay. Or do you step out on the lawn and you say, 
let go of Sally till I talk to her daddy or mama. What do you do? We have a culture right now that believes that it's, it's more kind for us to be quiet. We don't want to disrupt. We don't want to get in somebody else's business. Had a friend telling me about a self-defense class they took. It, it was a woman. Told me about the self-defense class. And, and she said, in my self-defense class, they said, it's always better to deal with the first crime as opposed to the second crime. I said, help, help me. Help me unpack that for me. She said, well, let's just say that you're in Walmart parking lot. You're getting into your car. You're loading up your stuff. And someone walks up behind you and you hear their gun click, and they push it into you, and they say, I've got a gun on you. I want you to come over to my car and get in. Now, right then and there, you think, well, I'll just be quiet and kind and go along with them, and I'll, I'll figure out a way later. Or do you do your best to beat them fight them, scream, and get someone else in the parking lot at Walmart to help you. You do the latter. You do everything you can to create a stir because this is what you know. Treatment at the local triage emergency room is more likely to save your life than it is if you go to the second crime. Because if you get in that van with them, if you go in that car with them, who knows where they take you and if anyone will ever hear you. You need to make a stir right now. You need to make it loud and you need to get other people involved and you might survive this. Our world has been telling us, shut up and go along, get in the car. And we haven't even seen the second crime that's happening in our world right now. And, and people are being impacted. And what they're doing to you and I is they're moving the boundary stones. They, they are openly telling you and I, you should not listen to a biblical worldview, that it's, it's backwards, it's outdated, and we know better. And I'm telling you, God created us male and female and that you cannot change this. This week, I had the privilege of meeting another man who, who used to be a woman. He transitioned. He spent part of his life in transition. It did not work. He came to know Christ Jesus. He is detransitioned, I guess is the term. And he now is helping other people get out of this. And he said, Doyle, let me just tell you. He said, it doesn't matter how many hormones you pump into your body. It doesn't matter how many surgeries that you have. He says, if they draw your blood or check your saliva and they look at your DNA, you're still a man or you're still a woman. Those are the facts. And he said, the best thing you can do for somebody is help them find out why it is they're questioning who they are and their identity Take them to the Word of God, pray with them, love them, help them, and they can recover from that. But if you and I, if you and I allow the crime to occur that takes them down a road, they will never be happy, they will be destroyed. And you and I have to have a conviction that we better start right now helping these children right now or they're in trouble. And see, this is the case that you and I have, all right? Now, I believe that you and I have to understand it from a spiritual understanding. So I want to give you an example from Moses' life, all right? This is Moses. It's Exodus chapter 2, if I remember correctly. I do. That's good. I like it when I remember right, okay? It says, Moses, you got to remember, Moses was a Jewish boy. He was given away, adopted by the queen of Egypt, and raised in the house of Pharaoh as a prince. And then this is what it says. It says, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. Don't you know what was going on in his life? In his mind, he's like, man, God, this is not fair. Why do I get to be in Pharaoh's house and they have to work like this? God, I was meant to be here. Why am I here he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. 
The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? <laughs> the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? You know, the answer to that is God, because God put him in the house of Pharaoh. Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. Now, why do I show you this? Listen, Moses saw the injustice. His heart went out. He saw it was wrong, but he solved it in the wrong way. He took matters into his own hands. He did it in the flesh, not in a spiritual matter, and he committed a sin. He murdered another human being. It was wrong. You may say, well, it was the right motive because they, 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 they no, 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 no. See, if you and I believe that we can solve the social justice issues in our generation from human effort, we will fail. We will destroy the people in our wake. We have to understand there was a spiritual way that God wanted to deliver the people of Israel. And it was through his mighty power. It was through God's mighty hand. And guess what Moses had to do? Moses had to submit to God's word. He had to follow God's instructions. And he had to do the, the process the way God wanted him to. We cannot solve the injustice of our world through human effort. And when, when we try to... Now, am I saying that there was not human effort in, in the role of getting women proper education? There was, but the church and, and God's people were a part of that. And, and at times the church got it wrong. And when we talk about the women's right to vote, the church was a part of it. And sometimes they got it wrong. We, we have a track record of being human and making mistakes. But, but the answer for women comes from God. The answer for your daughters and your sons comes from God and understanding their identity from him. And in the world in which we live, they want us to try to do it in our own strength and our own understanding. And God's word will guide us. There's a, there's a phrase that I hear commonly, and I think it's, it's problematic. You may have heard it. It says, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And the whole point is that the whole family should adjust themselves around making mama happy. I want to say that's unbiblical, and it's probably not going to be helpful. We could apply it to others. We could say, if the kids ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Can I tell you, if your cat ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> if your dog ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You might have to put them outside for a little while until they get over their unhappiness and they adjust. I don't know, all right? Not your children. I want to be clear on that. I was talking about the cat and the dog, all right? I don't want letters or emails. See, this is the problem. The goal in life is not for us to be happy. The goal in life is for us to glorify God. I can tell you that Jesus was not happy on the cross, but without his death on the cross, you and I don't get salvation. So there are times when God is going to put you in a position where you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. And you and I have to discern when is that, how is that, and, and we have to honor him according to his word. Now, this is what you need to know. As, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's wonderful that your daughters don't have the lids on them that previous generations did. You have so many job opportunities and, and, and so many, and I don't, I don't think women should get a different pay from a man if they're doing the same job. You understand? We realize that there are those things that have been going on and, and to some extent still go on and we're still working on that, okay? But there are some other things that our world is saying about women that are contrary to what will be helpful for women. And that is the, the idea that women don't need a man, but they can start a family, and you can. But ask any of the single moms in the church, any of the single dads in the church. They, they probably came to the single parenting not by choice, and it doesn't make life easier for you or the children. And that's why God designed it the way it is. But God has always been a part of that. There's some that say, well, you know, uh, I don't think that, that women should be teaching. Listen, 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 listen. 
I learn from women. The Tennessee representative knew to listen to his mama. He voted yes. Every man in this world, from my understanding, comes into this world through a woman, including Jesus. Even Jesus listened to his mama when she said, take some water, Jesus, you can solve it, at the wedding. In my life, Elizabeth Elliot, Catherine Marshall, uh, I can name, Lydia Prince. I just told you about uh, Elisa Childers' book that I, I, I read and I recommend to you. Listen, today's world is different in terms of the availability of women to teach and, and to lead in your life. But listen to what the, what the Bible says about this envy, this desire to be happy. Proverbs 27, 4 says, anger is cruel and fury is overwhelming. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that statement? Do you agree that anger is problematic? That if you allow anger to run your life, it'll destroy you. I, I agree, okay? Now, do you agree with the second half? The second half, he says, but who can stand before jealousy? What he's saying is, jealousy is a very powerful force. This is why Madison Avenue has used it for years. Madison Avenue will put in a big, hot, juicy burger on the, on the screen just to make you hungry. And it will Photoshop people to make them look better, to make you want to be like them. It creates a jealousy within you, an envy within you, and then you are discontent. It's why we've had problems from everything from eating disorders to debt problems because we think we need all these things and we, 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 we're, we're, in, we're in a dangerous way. Does that make sense? Listen to what James, the brother of Jesus, has to say. Now, remember James, okay? James is Jesus' brother. It was not easy growing up with Jesus as your older brother. He always got the answers right. He could walk on water and turn water to wine. How do you compete with that as a sibling? You think, you think James is ever jealous of what Jesus got to do and he didn't get to do? Listen to what James says here. It's powerful. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Now, see, the world in which you and I live right now is telling people, young people, old people, it doesn't matter where you are, it's saying it's okay to want what they've got. You can even want the gender they have. And it's encouraging people to be envious. It's encouraging us to want the wealth of our neighbor. It's encouraging us to want lifestyles. It's encouraging us. And what the Word of God says is, no, envy will destroy you. It will take you down a path. It will, you will begin to be led by demonic forces in the spiritual realm. You'll go from a physical reality into a spiritual reality that will destroy your life. And the reason this becomes important is you and I are responsible for envy, envy in our hearts. We're responsible to look at it and check it out. Envy is toxic, it's destructive, and it's sin. So the truth about men, the truth about women is this. In our generation, we've elevated envy and we've said it's okay. It's okay to be greedy. It's okay to want more. It, no, 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 no. That's not what Jesus said. Listen to this. This is Jesus. This is the final on it. Luke chapter 12, Jesus is teaching, and this, 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 this man comes to him, and listen to what he says. He said, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Huh. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? If this guy really knew Jesus, he could have had the answer, and he would have said, God the Father, God made you judge. Make him give me some. But this guy didn't really know Jesus. This guy was just wanting more money. He wanted what his brother had. And listen, I don't have time to unpack why the Bible says that the firstborn gets a certain thing. I get that, okay? There's something about it that's 
Seems strange to us, but God has an authority there, and I'll, I'll take that. That'll take 30 more minutes. You don't have it, and I don't have it, okay? But look what Jesus says to him. Then Jesus said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Jesus talks about it in terms of possessions. Jesus says, when you and I envy what someone else has, we need to be careful because we're not trusting God as our source, okay? If you go to this passage and you look at this whole passage, Jesus talks about wealth here. He talks about the danger of, of seeing that as the source in our life. And then he goes on and he says, do not worry. Do not worry. He says, are not the lilies of the field clothed more beautifully than Solomon was? So this is what you and I have to take from this, that you and I, Jesus makes us responsible for our heart. He looks at this man and he says, no, I'm not going to take from what your brother has and give it to you. I'm telling you, you need to adjust your heart. You need to judge your own heart. And so when you and I, when you and I become envious, the moment you and I see within us, and I'm guilty, you need to know, pastor's been guilty. I, I've been guilty of, of so many of this, and I've had to go to God and say, oh God, forgive me, forgive me, God, because I believe what the world had to say about women was, was, was right in, at times in opposition to your word. And I said, God, I'm sorry about that. And, and I had to come back and say, God, I'll, I'll take my role as a husband and as a father and I'll fulfill that and I'll, I'll do what I have to do. See, when, when you and I look at our neighbor and we envy them and we begin to covet that, it begins to let something bad go on in us. And we have to begin to say, Lord, forgive us. See, you and I are responsible for our heart. And this is what happens when you do that. You come back and you see your calling. You say, God, apparently you didn't call me into that position at this time. And I trust you more than I trust myself. And I'm asking you, God, to help me. Forgive me, Lord. I should never, ever want what they have. You gave that to them. I thank you for what you've given me. See? And so there's a repentance process. And God, help me to glorify you. And this is what I want to pray for you today, if you'll let me, okay? And I want to pray for you that God will make clear his calling and that you'll be able to get into that purpose, that you as a family, if you're a family here, that God's going to help you work together as a team. If you're a single, it's okay. God has a calling for your life. Lean into that. And, and if you'll discover that, he's made you male and female, you're beautiful. You are beautiful. You are exactly what he wanted you to be. And you lean into that and say, God, I want to fulfill your purpose. And in that, you'll have greater peace, fruitfulness, and happiness. And that's what's, what's most important. Amen? I invite you to stand, and I'm going to pray over you. And if you want this prayer, you just say amen at the end, okay? Then I would encourage you, begin to pray every day that God will make his calling clear and that he'll call his, cause his word to come alive and that his spirit, his Holy Spirit, will direct you to obedience in the word, okay? My call, God's calling, the word, and his spirit. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. They love you. They came to church. They've gathered around to, to listen to the word of God. God, they believe that you are the source of life and, and, and the world has been telling them different things. And God, we just say right now, forgive us. We repent of being envious. We repent of thinking that there's a way outside of your path that would work. Forgive us, Lord. We repent of that. We've been guilty of that. I've been guilty of that, God. I, I won't. I trust your word. I trust your spirit and your calling. And I pray right now, Lord, that every one of my brothers and sisters would begin to have a vision of your blessing, of your goodness, and your calling. Lord, I pray that they would become more and more fruitful as they follow your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey guys, if you have enjoyed what you've been listening and been encouraged in your faith or somehow God has answered a prayer from being a part of uh, the Church Next Door online, do me a favor, shoot me an email to pastor at tcnd.org. Just pastor at tcnd.org. Or like me on Facebook, send me a message. God bless you. Have a great week. Hope to see you soon.